the sharp saw, the fall of a tree in the stillness of the forest, have always been associated with peaceful pursuits of man. The harvest of timber paced the advance of civilization. Lumber for industry, lumber for new homes to shelter family life. As the demand for lumber increased, so did the demand for skills in the woods. Skills with the saw, with the axe and other woods tools. Skills passed along by the many generations of lumberjacks. Today we hear other sounds in the forest. Modern machinery has invaded woods work and the ring of the saw is being supplanted by the exhaust of motors and whirl of mechanical devices. The crash of falling timber is now heard with increasing regularity. The stepped up momentum does not change the fundamental rules of wood's work, however. Skills in logging, established by the hand saw, are still recognized. Let's review some of them. How to fall a tree and reviewing some of the phases of the job in the proper order of importance, tree felling should come first. The faller first determines the lean of the tree, the direction of fall. Sometimes a snap judgment on the lean is not advisable, especially for a straight tree. Frequently a more accurate decision on the lean of a straight tree can be reached by looking at it from some distance. This is called tree plumbing. Plumbing with the axe handle held vertically along the tree trunk. Now the lean or bend becomes noticeable. At the same time, the faller can also judge the size and density of branches if they will in any way offset this lean. It saves time and makes the felling job much easier by falling the tree with the lean. Now comes the undercut and first use of the saw. Also the first of many reminders that sawing requires good, solid footing. But let's explain the undercut before sawing starts. This notch is usually started with the saw and later chopped out with the axe. Its purpose is to tip the tree forward in the direction the fallers have decided the tree should go. More often, the notch is on the leaning side of the tree. The saw cut for the notch should point directly to the place for the fall. So it's important that the saw is started right. The sawing level of the cut should also be straight. Use a sawing stance which encourages free movement of arms and body. It means proper body balance which comes from solid footing which ensures straight side pulls with a slightly upward backswing of a free cutting saw. The notch for the undercut is usually less than a third of the tree's diameter. How deep the saw cut should go sometimes depends on the tree. The lean and condition of the wood in the tree are only a few of many points considered. In chopping out the undercut, the axeman should start high enough so that the angle of the notch is straight from the outside bark to where the saw cut ends. All the sawed wood must be chopped out if the notch is to serve its purpose. Uncut wood may prevent the tree from tipping towards the direction of fall, now determined by the axe man. In relation to the undercut, the back cut should be two or three inches higher. Most experienced sawyers say this practice is a safety precaution to prevent tree kickback. The cuts at separate levels will leave more holding wood to direct the fall of the tree. Now keep this in mind when you start the back cut. Also keep the saw cut straight. Start sawing by gripping the saw blade with one hand alongside the handle and pull straight back from the cut on a level with it. Let your hands ride the handle back as your partner pulls it his way. Pushing buckles the blade. Sometimes the tree must be persuaded to fall by the use of the hammer and wedge. Not because the sawyers guessed wrong on the lean as a rule, but due to adverse wind on a straight tree which may pinch the saw. Wedging the cut open frees the saw and at the same time forces the tree forward in the direction it should fall. The hammer and wedge 
have an important place in Wood's work, equal with the saw and axe at times. Keep alert and warn others, and when she cracks, go to a safe distance and watch for falling limbs. So ends our first lesson in tree felling. The beginner should realize by now that the saw by itself is not a dangerous tool. It becomes dangerous when used by man, when man ignores the safety codes, when thoughts are not on the job. The same rule applies in the use of all tools in the woods. The lumberjack's vocation becomes risky business only when man ignores or violates the safety principles and skills in wood's work. Cross-cut sawing requires teamwork. Men remain partners for many years because each man assumes certain responsibilities which ensures the safety and productiveness of the partnership. Work becomes habit-forming. Now this is what we mean. Safe practices become habits through constant use. Placing the saw on the log with handle extended to the partner is probably the safest way of passing the saw in the woods. Partners of long standing become so accustomed to correct working habits that they no longer associate their actions with safety codes. Sound practices have prolonged their partnership. In passing the saw, the partner should receive the handle first while keeping the saw teeth away from passer and receiver. Carry the saw a short distance in this manner. The safest place to carry the saw, however, is on the shoulder with the end handle removed from the saw. Carried in this position, it can be thrown from the shoulder in case of a fall, the most frequent cause for accidents. On short hikes to and from work, when there are two or more men in the crew, the man carrying the saw should always be the last in line. The reason is obvious, although the rule is often violated. When carried on longer hikes or when the saw is transported by other means, a sheath should cover the saw teeth. It is protection for the saw carrier and prevents damage to the saw. Several strings from the sheath are tied around the blade. If tied correctly, it can be removed as quickly as put on. While the saw may not have a streamlined appearance, it's a safe bet the man and the saw will both reach their destination undamaged. If the saw is left in the woods without a sheath, place the cutting edge against the log like this, but with the blade off the ground. Now the teeth won't harm man or beast. It is often said, and rightly, that a sawyer must file his own saw before he fully appreciates the care it should have in the woods. This closer relationship will also make the sawyer realize the abuse of a saw, especially the five and a half foot pattern used extensively for felling and bucking small timber. The tooth pattern of four cutting teeth to one raker requires a very exacting conditioning job. A jointer gauge levels all cutting teeth to the same height. This gauge uses a file, preferably a worn file, under the top bar. Now a screw is tightened with a screwdriver to hold the file in place. Resting on the saw teeth under slight pressure, the jointer is drawn across the entire length of the blade until all teeth touch the file as it passes over them. The tips of all cutting teeth must be set by a gauge called the spider. This gadget is designed with four legs and arranged in such a manner that when placed on the side of a cutting tooth, it will determine how much setting the tooth needs by the amount of rocking the spider performs on its legs. The hammer and anvil are applied to the tooth, tapping it lightly with the bevel of the anvil against the tip. When the spider legs are steady, the cutting tooth is set properly. 
Filing the cutting teeth requires skill, much care, and patience. All must receive the same treatment. Excessive filing can be more damaging than a dull tooth. A good filer knows when to stop. This is specialized work requiring many years of experience by men who have also seen service as skilled sawyers. The points of the raker teeth must be slightly shorter than those of the cutters. All must be uniform in height. Rakers are sharpened by running the file straight across the face until each tip comes to a sharp point. Until the V-shaped face has the proper angle. Raker points must be swedged or rounded to pull out saw shaving. The lack of clearance shown by this gauge indicates the amount of swedging the points need until rounded out properly. All must go under the slot by the same amount of clearance. The exacting job of jointing, setting, and filing the saw teeth and now honing the rough surfaces of the saw should convince any sawyer that the tool he is using cannot be thrown around carelessly. The conditioning job wouldn't last long. A sharp saw always gives sawyers a satisfied feeling of productive work when the saw cuts deep while riding free in the saw cut. The long saw shavings usually tell the story. A sharp saw is the most valuable asset in wood's work, and there are only a few simple rules to follow which will help keep the saw in good condition. Start the cut by guiding the saw blade. Only slight pressure is required to ensure a straight cut and keep the saw from jumping around. Now let the saw run free. The rounded blade does the cutting. The grip on the handle should be firm but flexible and the wrist relaxed along with arms and body. The hand on top guides the saw, while the hand underneath pulls the saw back. Don't ride the saw. It is faster and much easier without pressure. Saw with long, easy strokes. The saw has teeth throughout its entire length and does its best work when all of them are used. All of this can be accomplished if the sawyers stand on their own feet. It requires good, solid footing. The sawyer should feel secure, relaxed, and without danger of slipping. Don't let the saw pinch or bind in the cut. It will destroy the saw setting. Use the hammer and wedge to open the cut on the first sign of a pinch. The hammer and wedge are important tools. Use them and keep the saw running free. Sometimes the saw may run heavy because of pitch gathered on the saw teeth. By sprinkling a liberal amount of kerosene on both sides of the saw blade, this pitch will work itself loose from the teeth when the saw is in the cut again. Some trees are pitchy and a supply of kerosene or diesel oil is always handy. There are a few instances when water is preferred over kerosene, especially removing pitch from tamarack trees. Water will soften the pitch and remove it when sawing resumes, providing the weather is not freezing. Most all pinches are caused by the weight of the log against the saw cut, but there are several ways to remove the saw if the wedge still holds the cut open. One is to remove the saw under the log if there is ample space and without running the saw teeth into the ground. A more common practice is removing the handle from one end of the saw. It usually takes less time and eliminates chances of ruining a good saw conditioning job. There are various types of saw handles and attachments. This type has a pin that goes through a hole in the saw blade. Now the screw should be tightened until all play in the handle is taken up. Experienced sawyers usually find ways to prevent a saw pitch, even in small logs. With the saw pulled to its narrowest width in the cut, a wedge can be used, tapping it lightly. 
Now work the saw in short strokes until the cut is deep enough to clear the wedge. A hand spike can also be used, one man lifting and sawing at the same time. Or better still, one man lifting with a hand spike while the partner completes the sawing job. Without a wedge or a hand spike, some sawyers use the axe bit, sinking it at an angle across the saw cut. Careful work is required, however, so that the back side of the saw does not scrape the axe bit. Counter sawing is possible if the log is off the ground, but be sure the saw is free when the cut breaks. The know-how of eliminating saw pinches not only speeds production, but saves the saw and uh, many hot tempers. A saw has not been invented that will overcome all the various types of saw pinches in wood's work. The Swede saw will penetrate timber which would pinch most all other saw patterns. The thin and narrow blade has teeth set wide for clearance, and it is often used by one man on trail maintenance work. Speaking of trail maintenance, logs across roads or trails can be removed much easier and quicker by using the angle saw cut. Instead of starting the saw in the usual manner, the saw crew angles the cut across the log like this. This eliminates the binding of sawed ends, especially if the log is on the ground. Even if the down tree is hung up, but in a binding position, the angle cut will complete the job much quicker and with less danger of pinching. This may not be the orthodox cut to saw timber for lumber, but it does expedite trail work and makes the job much easier for the saw crew, especially for one man. Much larger logs can be handled with ease by using hand spikes to remove them from a road or trail. Sawing is not hazardous work providing the men exercise common sense, foresight, and take necessary precautions ahead of time. Brush, branches, and other obstacles which may interfere with sawing should be removed first. Careful preparations for the job are safety practices which pay dividends the time allotted to provide safe working conditions will eventually speed up the production. Time is never so important that chances should be taken. Stop the saw before removing a branch or other materials which interfere with the cutting teeth. This simple practice has prevented injuries which could be serious to man. Make the sawing job as comfortable as possible. On low cuts, Work in a kneeling position and give the saw wide clearance. It is less awkward than leaning heavily on the saw. The work can also be made more comfortable by taking the log off the ground onto skids, especially for sawing blocks in stove wood lengths. It is most convenient for one man who must stand erect to power and get the best results from the cross-cut saw. Now he can use the full length and roll of the saw, a combination which does the cutting. It provides the easy sawing rhythm which woodsmen appreciate. The time it takes to get the log off the ground is fully compensated later by the amount of additional work accomplished. With ends notched as placement for the saw log, two skids are usually required and two men can do the job without much trouble, aided with hand spikes using them alternately in holding and together when raising the log. Considerable back strain and lifting can be avoided in woods work by using stout green poles. Special initiative pays dividends. Safe and comfortable working conditions are the byproducts of woods experience. Methods illustrated thus far in the picture can easily be adopted by the beginner. Other features require years of experience in woods work. For example, felling timber, as illustrated at the beginning, did not include trees with a heavy lean. Such felling jobs sometimes require all the safety knowledge of the most experienced woodsman. The lean is evident and the tree looks healthy, but it could be hiding a rotten core. The bark may cover a split 
trunk. The undercut may reveal the answers in some degree. But this notch leaves two-thirds of the trunk in questionable condition. The procedure followed for sawing the back cut does not underestimate or take conditions for granted. Caution is exercised to avoid a cleaved trunk, commonly known as the barber chair. The course of action is to start the back cut in the usual manner, straight towards the undercut. Not too deep, however. Enough uncut wood must be left in the center of the tree to hold back the heavy lean. How far they should saw depends on the condition of the wood. When the first cut is considered deep enough, the saw is worked around to a new cut, sawing at a 45 degree angle to the undercut. They saw at this angle until the cut is approximately the same depth as the first back cut. When the second cut is completed, the faller should work the saw around in the back cut so as to keep the entire cut even until they are sawing approximately 45 degree left angle to the undercut. The purpose of the three cuts is to saw all the outer wood around the circumference of the tree, which includes the undercut. This leaves all the uncut wood in the center to hold back the lean. The outside cut should stop the tree from splitting in half. Now a few strokes of the saw through the center of the tree. And it's time to call timber. The unexpected can sometimes happen, but not often if the sawing job is planned right. Remember, start the back cut as usual, then the right angle cut, and later the left angle cut, and finally, sawing out the center until the tree falls. Although the mechanical lumberjack is steadily replacing the hand saw with many new gadgets to speed up production, the fundamental principles and skills of woodsmanship remain practically unchanged, regardless of modern devices. The undercut is sawed out instead of chopped out, and done faster and cleaner. The unit may be much heavier to move around between cuts, but the weight steadily decreases as the blade enters the tree until it becomes only a matter of guiding the chainsaw as it eats up the wood. Yes, the procedure is the same as the hand saw. Even to the use of hammer and wedge to avoid pinches, but not used as often, however. Progress and speed, one begets the other. Even in woods work, modern advancement is measured in speed between old and new labor-saving devices. The production momentum increases with cutting equipment which travels with speed in any direction, whenever and wherever the chainsaw has room to travel. The hammer and wedge become excess tools when a pinch can be avoided by sawing double cuts through the log. Speed is now the important factor although the rules remain the same. So the skills of the lumberjack, the safety codes of the woods, handed down through generations of woods work, will remain with us for years to come. These rules are important. Remember them and be a good sawyer. <laughs>